Welcome, everybody. We're going to get going here shortly. We've got a number of people still joining us here for today's session on Kelvault best practices for installation and commissioning of the HAB energy storage system. So give us a few more minutes as we let some other folks uh, join, and then we'll be going, uh, uh, going with the presentation shortly. Thanks. Okay, we're going to get started now. Thank you again for joining us for today's Kilovolt best practices for installation and commissioning. Uh, this is specifically around the HAB energy storage systems. I'm Jay Galassa with Alt E, and uh, for our speakers today, we have Nate Dooley. Nate is a strategic account manager uh, with Kilovolt. Um, and we have Marlon May, who is uh, part of our technical support team for Kilovolt. And uh, they're gonna be your main presenters today. I'm gonna give a couple of quick intros to the first couple of slides here. So I'm going to stop this one. If you could go ahead and share uh, the presentation, Nate, and then I'll kick things off and you guys can take it away. Sure thing. Just give me one second here. All right. Hope everybody's enjoying the conference so far. We've had uh, two pretty full days of, of sessions. I know the open networking sessions at 3 p.m. Eastern every day has, has been a big hit. Hopefully you can join us with that uh, this afternoon. If you um, haven't done any of these before, it's really a great way to go and get more, you know, even more questions answered for yourself. All right, so it looks like we're ready to get going. So as I said before, this is the best practices for installation and commissioning of the HAB energy storage systems. So we've made a number of improvements of the HAB over the last few years, and I just wanted to uh, review a little bit uh, kind of where we came from on that. The original model, um, you know, we had beta sites going out in 2018, and then we started selling it in earnest in uh, early 2019. That was our version one, although we didn't necessarily refer to it as version one. That was our original model. And then uh, we made some improvements uh, in early 2020 with uh, upgraded memory to support some additional features and functions. And uh, again, version two was kind of how we called it internally, but we didn't actually show that uh, so much because it was really just mainly internal, uh, internal changes there. And then uh, early last year, if we go to the next slide, uh, we made the most visible changes to the product since its original introduction. The electronics in the version three is essentially the same as the version two, but it was packaged very differently based on feedback we got from a lot of our uh, installer customers, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, the original one had relatively small um, uh, connections for the, the DC uh, input and output, uh, you know, the plus and minus on the, on the uh, side of the unit. And that limited how you could install it. Um, so we, you know, and, and plus the, um, uh, you know, the size of the cables 
that you needed to go there, we're making it kind of a tight connection. So after uh, hearing from a lot of you, we made changes to the case, and that allows, as I'm sure Nate will kind of go through some of the um, the easier to install options uh, that we introduced last year at the beginning of the year with that version three. And then actually right at the end of last year and, and certainly going forward now in this year, the version four looks you know identical from the outside. There are a couple of subtle differences on the inside uh, in terms of how, how you connect them the different kinds of uh, actual connectors inside. But the biggest thing is that uh, it uses a new BMS with some new capabilities that allowed us to get it uh, UL rated. So it's UL 1973 rated currently, and we are um, actively testing it for 9540 with a couple of the different popular inverters uh, that we are typically working with. And, um, you know, also having 9540A testing done, that's not a specific certification, but we are having uh, that, that testing, testing done. done. So I'm, I'm sure you're hearing that from other uh, energy storage system suppliers, and, you know, we're, we're going through the same kinds of certifications here. Just for a quick look at the version comparisons from the version one all the way to the version four, um, all of them have this uh, CAN bus connection that's used for inter-battery communications, allowing the batteries to, uh, when you have more than one of them connected, allowing them to uh, do a number of things like balancing when they're charging and discharging. Um, in version two, with that added memory, it allowed us to provide some additional features, including the HAB IT cloud support. And uh, there's some important things there that uh, Nate and uh, Marlon will be talking about. Um, and that also allowed inverter closed loop communications and allowed en enough memory in the uh, BMS to be able to do those. And uh, going forward, those, those features are supported from V2 all the way to V4. And the wiring access panel, that lower section, you know, that was added and it's the same basically on version three and version four. Just a couple of compatibility notes on the bottom there. Um, the version one, there is a, uh, a newly minted firmware upgrade for version one units that are out in the field to communicate on the same uh, CAN bus network with version two and, and later models. So if you are mixing a version one with uh, newer models, you know that is now uh, supported with this latest firmware upgrade. And the only other thing is there's a slight cable difference between the version four and the version three. So, and the same uh, cable is on version two. And so if you're gonna be using version four in combination with the others, there is a special cable that has a connector, a different connector on each end so that it um, you know, plugs into both in the appropriate way. So that's kind of a quick update on, on where we are. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to, uh, to Nate and Marlon, take us through the rest of it. Thanks, Jay. Can you hear me all right, everyone, as I'm talking? Well, mostly Jay, if you're on. Yeah, no, it sounds good. Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> All righty. So, um, yeah, we're going to get right into everything here. Um, before we get into what's new and some of our best practices, we'll just review the technical specs here, which remain largely unchanged from our V1, V2 batteries, as uh, many of you who are familiar with the batteries probably know. But for those that don't, it's a seven and a half kilowatt hour, 48 volt nominal lithium iron phosphate battery. It's shown here with our standard wall mount rack um, coming in at about 230 pounds. And um, it does have integrated Wi-Fi, as Jay mentioned, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the next slides. It's rated at approximately 6,000 cycles at 80% depth of discharge. And the peak current specs are listed there, 150 amp max discharge and 120 amp max charge. Um, a quick note on that in regards to design considerations as you're working through this with your customers or if you're a homeowner considering the, the HAB for your storage system, it's really important to take into account how the battery is going to be treated 
you know, based on the size of the inverter you're working with, based on the size and quantity of charge controllers that you have. The general rule of thumb is that, you know, batteries, even lithium batteries do like to be charged more gradually, um, if at all possible. One of the big selling points of lithium is that they can accept much more rigorous charge and discharge currents. So you'll see here in our warranty, we do call that out as um, an allowed um, benefit of the hab. You know, you can charge the battery at 120 amps continuously per battery, that is. So if you have two batteries in a bank, you now have 240 amps of allowable continuous charge current um, and 150 on the discharge end. However, you inherently are going to get a shorter lifespan out of the battery if that is in fact how it's being treated. And our warranty is adjusted to reflect that. And that's not something that's unique to Kilowatt by any means. You'll see these sort of contingencies in most, if not all, lithium iron phosphate battery um, manuals and warranties. Um, but the nice thing about the kilovolt warranty is that we will support either. Um, so if you have an application where you're less concerned about cycle life, maybe the battery is only used for backup applications, um, that might be a really nice excuse to take advantage of the higher charge and discharge rate, put in only one battery or two batteries and um, charge it really rigorously when needed or discharge it really rigorously when the grid goes out. And then it sits you know, for another few months until the next utility outage. So I'd say in terms of design considerations, this is an important thing to keep in mind that it's supported either way, but which warranty track you're on is determined by how it's being treated. Um, and if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it more in the um, open networking session later. I'm happy to bounce around some use case um, examples to explore this further. So uh, just a quick look back at the new features uh, or at the new look, I should say, of the, the V3 and V4 hab. Much sleeker in my opinion, but um, the actual LCD panel you'll see here remains largely unchanged. So you still see the voltage, the kilowatt hour, the capacity, state of charge, temperature, rough cycle count, all of that. You have your on off switch um, there. Marlon, can you see my cursor on the shared screen? Can you give me a nod? Okay. So the on off button here, your run light, your alarm light, and the nice state of charge indicator from across the room. If you uh, just look over, you should get an approximation of the the rough state of charge here. And then here's the new wiring access panel that Jay had mentioned previously. Um, uh, also new with the, the new V3 and V4 cases are the integrated handles. The older versions had a handle that came attached that you would hook it onto the battery and then lift. These are nice, they're hinged and uh, fold back down the main inset in the battery there. Um, so definitely nice to have these um, fixed um, handles on the side. It is a heavy battery, as we said. <laughs> Um, so uh, people really didn't like, a lot of people really didn't like the original handle. So this was a nice development. You also get your on off switch here below the spec, um, placard there, and you get two different types of vents that come with it. Um, the hotter vent or sorry, the vented panels recommended in, in hotter environments on obviously the non vented ones in colder environments. Um, important to note that the HAB does not have the integrated heaters like our HLX Plus line of batteries do. So it cannot accept the charge below 32F or 0C. So always best practice to have it in preferably a climate controlled or at the very least a nice insulated um, uh, setting or um, in hotter environments, a well ventilated setting to keep it cool. So something to consider again, as you're working through your designs with your customers or for your own home. Um, and just looking again at the, the wiring panel more closely, this is um, with the front panel removed here in the center, you'll see you have plenty of space to land those large DC conductors, um, which is which is nice just because you, uh, it, it makes for ease of installation, but you also have conduit access on the bottom, the left and the right. So especially if you have a utility room full of batteries, it's nice to have that flexibility where you come into the wiring compartment and having plenty of space here to make those um, connections. All right, so now do we are going to, to just work through some of the notable advantages of the HAB. So this is for for installers, if you can think about it as selling points for your customers or um, 
for homeowners, reasons you might consider to have. The first really, um, in my opinion, one of the most important is the um, variability in terms of how the HAB can be configured. So just a single unit for your most critical loads for fridge, some lights and whatnot, expanded up to multiple units. Um, I have a customer that started with just one and then over the course of the year, as his budget allowed, he's added up to three, four now, I think, um, and just slowly moved more circuits over from his main panel to his critical loads panel. It's a battery backup. Um, utility interactive uh, use case. So that's really nice to be able to start small and then expand as the budget allows. Obviously, always best to do that sooner rather than later to try to keep the batteries the same age. Um, and it can be expanded. We support up to 14 batteries in parallel. So a total of um, 105 kilowatt hours um, in total, 80% depth of discharge is 80 or so kilowatt hours usable. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we uh, in the past, I've only had our standard uh, wall mount uh, backplate as the mounting option, um, which can be a little tricky <laughs> if you're lifting 100 and, or sorry, 230 pounds up on the wall. We're excited to now have a couple other options, one of which will be the floor mount you see here. Um, so now the weight of the battery is supported by the um, floor mounted structure here, and the battery will be uh, affixed to the wall with these two brackets. So um, another customer of mine actually ended up building a couple of them have built, you know, something similar to this because they were afraid their walls could support, um, you know, five or six halves up on the, up on the walls. So it's nice to be able to not worry as much about the, the load bearing capability of your wall and put them on the ground without, you know, putting them directly on the, the floor if there's anything sort of um, a wet basement or something like that. Um, and then we're also going to be offering our dual floor mount, which actually has um, wheels and uh, little feet here to secure it in place. Um, nice for um, originally installing the batteries and being able to move them or roll them where you want, or if you need to temporarily move them out of the way, um, as long as the DC conductors will allow. Um, and you can put, like I said, two batteries on this um, facing away from each other. So we're excited to come up with those. And give you all a little bit more flexibility uh, in regards to your, your mounting um, preferences. And then we're gonna look now at all of the different communication capability of the HABs. This is uh, one of the most, if not the most important um, or notable advantage of the HAB line of batteries um, is the, that, that it is a smart battery. Aside from the BMS uh, included in hopefully any lithium iron phosphate battery you might be considering or your customers considering, you get a lot of communication capability with the HAB. So the first would be um, access to the um, cloud service. And um, Jay, you said my sound's not great. Is it worth switching to Marlin or is it enough where you can get the gist? No, we, we, we get it just every once in a while. I don't know if it's something that's loose or whatever, but uh, mm -hmm. every once in a while it drops out a little bit. Okay. Sounds good right now. All right, well, we'll, we'll go with it until it's bad. So just drop me a line if we need to switch. Um, so the beauty of working from home is that I'm uh, at the mercy of my local um, cable provider, which is not great. So everyone cross your fingers. Um, but yeah, so we have the access to the cloud IT and the... Um, the benefit of the HAB is that you get not only your local monitoring, so even if there isn't a local area network connection at the site, the HAB has integrated Wi-Fi so that you can download the app on your mobile device and still access the, um, the local version of the app um, to get all of the same info that you would um, if you were to connect it um, remotely. And that's simply done by connecting to the HAB locally, selecting your local area network. And then at that point, the HAB will report um, securely to the cloud and that data can be accessed anywhere um, so long as the Wi-Fi connection is maintained at the site. And it can also be shared, which is really nice. So if you are an installer putting the HAB in, you can share, um, it'll generate a unique QR code to send to your customer so they can add the HAB as a shared device um, or vice versa if you wanna add your installer. And beyond that, it also allows our tech support, Marlin, um, to um, access the HAB remotely to um, 
perform diagnostics as well um, and push firmware updates. So no need to download anything onto a USB and plug it in. You, we can push firmware updates over the cloud. Um, so we're going to take a quick look at the, the mobile IT um, app, or sorry, the Hab IT mobile app um, available on the Apple and Android app stores. This is remained large, has remained largely unchanged. So we'll just click through it quickly. Um, for those who have not seen it, you just download the app, set up an account, scan the QR code on the battery. Um, and like I said, once you are locally connected, you can connect it to your um, uh, local area network if applicable. On the main basic page here, you can see the rough state of charge, voltage, uh, amp hour capacity. You also get this on off button here. And on the advanced tab in the middle, you get a little more info regarding your current temperature, rough cycle approximation, and then all the way over here, your event log. So any events reported by the BMS, um, low voltage, low temperature, and so on. And then um, one other very notable feature of the HABs uh, is their inter-battery communication network. So this is done over CAN bus and Jay alluded to this earlier. This is something that's I think really unique in what allows us to support such large banks. Now, lithium iron phosphate cells inherently charge and discharge differently. So that's why we, one of the reasons we have a BMS to balance the cells within a battery, but in a lot of large banks, um, especially in, with lead acid banks, we don't have a way to balance batteries um, and some other lithium batteries. Um, we don't have a way to balance between batteries. Um, so it, what's nice is that these batteries are able to balance one another. And I think this, these couple bullets here are really important for installers to understand, to be able to explain to customers, especially tech savvy customers that are really concerned with their batteries and pay close attention to them. Um, the balancing is done upon charging and discharging. So if you have the battery sitting idly um, and you notice that one battery is a, a few volts different and you let it sit for eight hours and then get really frustrated that it's still there and they're not balancing, that is normal. <laughs> that is acceptable and that's okay because the balancing is done upon charging or discharging. So let's say battery two is two volts higher than batteries one and three. What will happen is you'll actually notice the green run light will be flashing upon charging. And what that means is that this battery has pretty much removed itself from the parallel connection of batteries um, and is going to ex stop accepting a charge until the other batteries arrive within roughly one volt or so. You know, we're not, when we talk about balancing, we're not really concerned about one volt or a few tenths of a volt difference. Um, and you'll hopefully see that um, resolve itself over time. They're probably never gonna be exactly the same voltage and that's okay. But what will happen is you'll see that as they charge and discharge, the voltages will balance out so that they're all roughly within one volt or so of each other. And as long as they are, that's, um, that's what we care about. And again, any other questions about this as um, in the open networking session or in the Q&A, um, Marlon and, and I, and um, could, we can work through those at that time. Um, and the last thing, I'm going to hand this over to Marlon in a second here to just talk through some of our best practices for commissioning and whatnot. But the, the last major feature that Jay mentioned in the beginning that we are introducing or in the process of rolling out is our closed loop communication with the HABs. So this closed loop communication obviously refers to communication between your battery bank and your inverter. Um, so the first example here is with the Solark 12K, um, we will support closed loop communications. And what this does is that it, it allows the BMS of the battery to communicate via Modbus directly with the inverter. So it can communicate its charge and discharge limits. Um, it can communicate its state of charge directly to the inverter. Um, and this is really helpful because in normal uh, system setups, the inverter is only able to see the battery voltage at these DC terminals here, which is obviously not the exact voltage that you're going to see here because of voltage drop, obviously also depending on your wire run and how your conductors are sized. So it's nice. It, it adds a lot of um, uh, efficiency uh, and improved performance to the system. If the batteries are able to tell the inverter directly, 
here is my state of charge, here is how I want to be charged, and here are the limits that you need to set for yourself to disconnect before I ever have to. Um, so Solark, as probably many of you know who are familiar with it, can be used in DC and or AC coupled applications. Um, the one thing that you will need to note with Solark um, closed loop uh, installs as soon as that is officially supported um, is that there will be a new comm cable that Kilovolt will be shipping to customers that have existing setups that they're waiting to enable um, closed loop with. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marlin now for our other um, uh, inverter system that we will be supporting with closed loop. And Marlin, you can take it away whenever you are ready. All right, one moment, please. And I can okay. hear for you if you want. So just uh, carry on. I am, I am ready when you are. So next. Oh, okay. So um, regarding closed loop communi closed loop communications, um, it that is now available with the Schneider XW Pro. We are actually um, undergoing the very final stages of testing with a uh, with with some customers, and it is working very very well. Um, So what does what does that actually what does it actually provide? Well, um, as has been said, it provides state of cold, state of charge control for improved state trans state transitions. You'll actually will be you'll have your XW Pro in um, state of charge control rather than voltage control in order for things to work correctly. Um, so it does um, then optimizes the charging and battery improved protects against added battery over voltage protection. Um, the uh, I'm sorry, I just got a quick message there. Um, so the I'm sorry, let me go ahead and close that window. Okay, so it does actually provide also enhanced AC coupling controls. Actually, um, and um, and Eric from uh, Schneider actually goes into that in great detail as far as the um, enhanced AC coupling that is provided uh, through the um, Schneider Schneider Insight. And the and uh, also when it when you have closed loop control, the XW Pro and it is the XW Pro only. The XW Plus does not have this capability. It follows the charge and discharge limits according to the um, the HABS BMS. It's actually taking instructions from the BMS in, in order to be able to uh, protect the battery for charge and discharge limits. And um, also along the same lines, the um, inverter protection settings are also, um, they're designed to trip before the BMS reaches, before uh, BMS starts to issue commands to protect uh, to pre protect the battery itself so that those um, uh, the protection settings that you would normally program into your XW Pro, your high voltage disconnect, low voltage disconnect, uh, current disconnects and so on are actually taken care of by the HAB. Um, Next thing. So this is actually a very um, uh, simple process. It's basically a, a couple of steps. First, you do the physical physical connections like we showed in the previous slide. Once that's done, uh, you'll go ahead and do connections through the inside um, through the inside home. So the the so the last part, last physical connection you're going to make, you're going to is to connect the um, the insight to the hab itself. Um, on version the version three hab had a um, Uh, an amphenol connector, thank you very much, which um, an amphenol connector, which you um, uh, then, which has one end is stripped, the other end has the amphenol connector that you would then um, 
connect into the connection uh, bus of the Insight um, Insight Home, and we actually do have we have the instructions as to which um, which wires to strip and where they go. It's a little different between the Insight Home in the Insight facility and and Gateway. By the way, the Gateway is able to uh, be used for the closed loop communications. Um, the uh, V4 hub, because of we went to with a more standard cable. It's a it is it's an ether it's a, basically it's an Ethernet connection. Um, but you will once again have to strip off the strip off the um, the end in order to then expose the wires that will then go into the connection block on the um, on the inside. Um, next, please. So once you have done that. Uh, simply go into um, apologies here. You go actually go into um, insight your insight um, insight local and actually do the configuration. Configuration is very uh, straightforward here. Hold on here. Because basically what you'll be doing you. Yeah, I think ahead, Marlon, it's it's um, it's it's as simple as selecting the hab from a drop down menu. The menu, right? Exactly. Yeah. Select hab from a drop down menu. Um, after you have, uh, um, we actually have the instructions on the setting the correct baud rate and so on. You select hab from the drop down menu and you um, uh, hit apply. Then you'll see in the in the the upper um, picture you'll see the um, in the lower right hand corner you see it you see an icon that actually looks an awful lot like the um, the Schneider battery monitor icon but that is actually showing that it's connected to the BMS and the name that ends up showing there um, CCAN underscore BMS zero that is that's just the, that's the name it shows up as and that is not that's not changeable um that uh uh that name okay and uh next please all right so let's talk a little bit about some of the like tips and tricks for installing and commissioning your your hab next please so best practices so um before you install, please make note of the HAB serial number and MAC address. You can either take pictures of them or, or just uh, 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 take pictures of the labels on the side of the of the um, of the HAB, and then you'll just go ahead and uh, store them in a safe place. You can even it might even be uh, uh, good to put a, a sticker on each on each HAB. That's forward facing, so you know which which hab is which, and the serial numbers just just in case you need to make note of, of what is going on with a particular hab, because we also will then use if you, if you have an issue, we need to then uh, we'll actually ask you for that information, including where it is in your um, uh, where it is in your battery bank, what address it's been given, and so on. Um, Definitely, you need to know the environment of the installation site before you install the HAB because of the temperature sensitivities of lithium iron phosphate batteries in general. Um, uh, you do want to make sure that it doesn't get, you know, too hot or too cold, um, which is why we include both solid side plates and vented side plates. Um, with the with the packaging if it's going to get closer you know get down into the low range closer to freezing i would use you know use the solid plates instead of the vented ones so the batter as the battery is used it it can help to keep itself warm you can also consider insulating the installation site on the other hand if in a warmer warmer conditions you end up using the vented the vented plates and you can mix and match them so if you actually get um 
uh, get the, uh, uh, get the best result in keeping the, um, keeping the battery at a, a good operating temperature. Um, now, before, when you're actually commissioning your, just commissioning your system, you want to charge each half in your battery bank up to 56 volts before you put them into service. Um, this is also very important. Next, please, Nate. Yeah, especially if you are adding a new hab into an existing battery bank, you want to charge, not only, not only do you want to charge the new battery up to 56 volts, you want to have, to have the rest of your bank up to 56 volts also. That just makes it much easier for the, um, for the leader in your, in your bank, um, to actually help to coordinate and keep your batteries, um, as close as possible in, in voltage. Uh, next, please. Yeah, I think I think one um, oh, go ahead. Um, note on that too is that we often will get tech support calls, um, as I alluded to earlier about the balancing not working, especially if the, the voltage difference is really significant. It's just going to take a lot more time and effort really for the batteries to balance. So that's why this is a best practice. And I think if I were just listening to this presentation offhand, I might be scratching my head and say, well, I thought they were supposed to balance. So why the hell do I need to do this? But it's it's definitely best to to do it from the from the get-go. And also important to remember that when we um are selling our, our 12 volt batteries, which we'll talk more about tomorrow, um, normally we'll recommend buying a separate 12 volt charger to do the individual thing. But with your HAB, you normally, in most cases, are installing this with an inverter charger that is, in theory, already been programmed to the correct settings for the HAB. So it's really just as simple as disconnecting the other HABs that you might have in the bank from one another and um, only allowing the inverter charger to bring up each HAB. So hopefully not much of a to-do, just as simple as flipping a few switches if you have individual breakers um, or just use the ones on the HAB. Um, to charge each one with the integrated charger. Sorry, Marlon, that is all. No worries, no worries. Um, one other um, thing of note regarding uh, mixing, um, regarding adding new HABs to an, to an existing bank, if you are mixing HAB versions, say if you have a have a uh, have some version twos or version threes, you want to add a version four. Um, you want to make sure that you set the most recent hab as the leader. So if yeah, um, if things will, uh, it will just, things will just work, will work out better that way. Version four will have a, uh, is much more, it's a much more adept at, at hand, at handling a mixed, um, a, a bank that made up of mixed, um, Mixed tabs. Uh, next. Now, now, if you do have version one halves in your bank, um, please, you know, contact your distributor, contact Kilovolt for assistance. There, are few, we'll just, we we'll just, we we'll need to go over a few, um, few things regarding updating and so on, just to, to make sure that you don't run into any issues in, um, with, with your, with your battery bank. Um, so now, if you have internet access at your installation site, then you can actually use update your HABs yourself using the HAB Habit app. In the uh, section of the HAB where you would, where you can uh, verify what um, firmware versions you are uh, are currently installed for a particular HAB. Um, if a um, if a firmware update is available, you actually will see notifications saying that a firmware update is in, is available. And um, then, if you uh, then at which point you can simply um, uh, click that in order to uh, trigger the downloading installation of the firmware on onto that particular hab. Um, the tempo of firmware, I had a question earlier regarding how often they are, uh, firmware updates are coming. The tempo has slowed considerably as, um, as we have, you know, work continuously on the platform. Uh, the, um, 
they are now uh, with, with, with the launch of the V4, we've had uh, only had a couple of firmware updates. They are, they are much less frequent now. Um, next one, Nate. Yeah, and I forgot to include a screenshot. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I forgot to, oh, no, not with the background. No, no, you're not going to see that, yeah. Firmware in the, um, yeah, I think so. I'm the camera. The firmware uh, version in the um, Hab IT app is just the top three little bubbles in the or dots in the top right corner of the app. Very easy to find. Sorry, Marla. Carry on. No worries. No worries. Um, some charge controllers or inverted chargers, um, like the Solark, for example, needs you need to actually put in the total total resistance of your bank. In which case, then you use this formula. Um, go ahead and. Yes, so N is the number of halves, and R is the resistance, internal resistance for a single hab. Um, so for example, let's say you had, if you had, I, and I should have sticked this in as an extra line, so say you had two halves, so it would be one over two times um, one over 15, which comes out to 5.06 um, milliohms, which makes sense because when you have uh, when you have multiple circuits in parallel, their total resistance is going to be less than the uh, resistance of any single one branch on that um, on, the, on that parallel branch. Um, and we see that we have had um, had quite a few questions come in. Um, let me see if I can access those as well. Uh, um, uh, the first one here from Ben. Thank you very much, Ben. He said, well, can you can it accept a relay from a remote, a remote switch to turn off the battery? Um, no, that is not a feature of the of the of the kilovolt hab. Um, so yeah, we've had. Um, uh, we have had questions about that regarding you know, doing uh, doing remote shutoff um, tied to an R to an tied to an, an RSD a RSD system, and that is not um, that has not been implemented in the Kilovolt app. Yeah, so I mean, for that, we'd probably be looking at doing something like the um, remote chip breaker for midnight in the midnight birdhouse. Um, I think. That, if I remember correctly from Sean White's presentation from last year, the those um, requirements for disconnecting um, batteries and inverters um, are also going to be probably pretty fluid in the next couple of years, and we're going to start to learn more. I would highly recommend Sean's class on Friday, just a quick plug for that, um, if you are interested, because um, he definitely has a much, much better knowledge of the actual requirements and maybe some more insight into where they're going um, than Marla or myself would. So I would highly recommend that. Um, I will take Philip's question, Marlon. Um, okay. So that live. So Philip asked, what's the largest inverter that can be connected to one hab? So this is going to go back um, to our initial um, discussion on charge rate. charge rate. So if you think about um, discharge rate in terms of, or sorry, inverter size in terms of discharge rate, um, we could calculate the max discharge rate of the inverter by roughly dividing its maximum continuous output by the battery voltage. So let's say you had, or just look at the, the specification sheet for the inverter. Um, but let's say you had a um, 6,800 watt inverter discharging at, you know, about 54 volts nominal, we'll call it, or so for the um, HAB, 6,800 over 54 is about 125 amps. So that puts you in this um, top category here, maybe pushing it a bit um, for a single HAB bank. 
So the simple solution would be to add a second hab or just limit your maximum output on the inverter so that it never discharges. Um, sorry, that was for charge rate. So discharge rate, you'd still be under 150. So you never discharge above that current level. So conceivably 14 habs in parallel would give you 150 amps times 14. And you'd be hard pressed to find a single inverter on the market that's going to exceed that. Um, but obviously a stacked system of, of inverters is going to um, amount to some pretty high discharge currents. But that's the rough math that I would follow to um, figure out how your inverter size compares to um, your uh, quantity of batteries required. And the other important thing to keep in mind is the, the charge rate as well. So if you are um, going to be charging continuously from 10 different Morningstar 80 amp or 60 amp charge controllers, that's 600 amps of charging capacity. You're gonna to need to take that into account as you're sizing your battery bank as well. Thank you very much, Nate. So a question from James here, how often do these need to be discharged in a backup only situation to reset the state of charge? Uh, we have state of charge all over the board on one of our multi-battery installs. So, um, we do recommend that they be given a, uh, given a full charge um, every six months or so. That also will, will tend to reset the battery's, um, uh, battery's state of charge um, calculations. It basically they do the battery does kind of learn over time to actually associate a particular uh, voltage with the state of with the state of charge, but that can um, that can drift a bit. So they do occasionally they do occasionally need to be like told like where a hundred percent is. Um, so so we do recommend um, with the um, HABs as we do with the HLUX pluses that they. Uh, be given a full charge every six months or so. Um, so from Philip, do they need to be vented outside or can the battery be in a utility closet? Oh, utility closet um, that gets air um, supply and return air from the house's HVAC. Yeah, actually, that is a great place for them. In general, um, lithium, lithium iron phosphate batteries kind of they like to be where we are they um putting them in a in a in an interior closet in a home is a is a great place for them in terms of the environment um because those are also the temperatures at which people are um people are uh are comfortable and in which case um i would for an interior place like a finished basement um I would probably start with the with the uh, with the vented plates, you know, just to see how cool it gets down there. If it gets a little gets a little chilly, then go ahead and start replacing some of the vents with the vented plates with the solid ones. Yeah, and I think it just um, this might be implied or assumed, but completely safe chemistry to have in zero off gassing, zero risk of thermal runaway. Um, totally fine to have it in your bedroom if you can get over the, the hum from the inverter and um, the lights from the batteries. Yep, that's that's exactly right, Nick. Yeah, that unlike unlike um, other lithium um, chemistry batteries, uh, there's no there's no risk of thermal runaway with LFPs. And also unlike lead acid batteries, there's there's no venting whatsoever. Um, uh, let's see. Do we have uh, for from James here? Does the X, XP MPPT 100 600 also follow the BMS charge settings? Um, from what I remember from uh, from the XW Pro, that the XW Pro does not like issue commands in order to uh, to uh, to the charge controllers, I will have to check and with Eric to make absolutely sure if the um, MPPT 100 is also looking at the um, at the. Um, I think Marlon, I think I can provide a little bit of uh, oh, info on that. Yeah. Thank you. 
This is Jay jumping in here. Sorry about that. Um, I think the, the, the plan within Schneider is to have the charge controllers uh, settings automatically set by the configuration at the insight level, but that's not available right now for the charge controllers, just for the XW Pro. Uh, so those settings would have to be set manually at this time. However, their direction is to have that integrated at a future time. Thank you, Jay. Um, from Giovanni, so what sort of information does the log file store? Um, does it require any action to activate it? Um, no, there's no, no action required to activate it other than connecting the HAB to the cloud. And it, um, and it contains some pretty um, granular uh, uh, diagnostic information such as um, individual cell temperatures, individual individual cell um, uh, cell voltages, uh, uh, what um, what uh, any warnings or alarms that happen to uh, happen to have taken place. Um, it's a it's very comprehensive and not really not really uh, Definitely, it's, it's designed for the kilovolt engineers to look at, so in order to be able to uh, help to um, uh, di well, for diagnostics. Yeah, and Giovanni's other question um, was regarding setting um, parameters for uh, Outback GS radians, I assume. Um, we so we have a generic integration guide for the HAB and the specification or the settings for the inverter charger are pretty much everything that you would need for the the radians. So that's going to include rebulk, um, LBCO, high BCO, HBCO, all float and absorb voltages. Um, the the only one that you're really going to need to play with probably um, is the is the rebulk if you wanted that slightly higher or slightly lower dependent on when you wanted to initiate a bulk charge or when you wanted um, a grid connect volts as well when you wanted the grid um, to connect to the to the inverter or sorry when you wanted the inverter connect to connect to the grid um, so if you attended Outback's presentation. I don't know if this is for the existing system or for future systems, but Outback's new inverter, the Mojave, does have, I believe, the kilovolt in the the drop down menu um, of pre saved settings. So for their their newer inverter, you should be able to select that. I don't know if Optics has the settings in there now for the HAB. Um, I don't believe so. Um, but the short answer, long answer to a short question is that you um, should be able to use our generic uh, integration guide for the HAB. And I don't think there's any settings in the, um, uh, the Outback setup that wouldn't be answered by that. Well, let's see. Um, I have a question here from Kurt um, asking if the oval voltage alarm comes on. Uh, with the HAB, will the HAB turn off at some point? If the over voltage, over voltage or alarm comes on, what the battery does is actually will go ahead and sh it actually will shut off, shut off charging. The BMS will not allow the battery to charge, um, to charge anymore. Uh, and um, it will then, so when the next discharge cycle starts, it'll then it will then, uh, if that happens, if, after, if for some reason that battery is higher than the others in the bank, it will actually um, start to discharge that one, bringing it down to the others, and then they will all then start to uh, go discharge together. That is where the the balancing between uh, the um, the batteries actually takes place as the uh, bank charges and discharges. Uh, let's see, we're at five till, do we want to? Yeah, I'm just skimming through the questions here. Um, any of these that we can't get to, just hop into our networking session in an hour and we can, we can go over them live. Um, any quick ones we can answer now. Um, 
are the RJ45 cables provided with the V4 long enough to reach stack units, vertically stacked units with the eight inches of clearance? Marlon, do you know how long those cables are offhand? I'd have to, I don't know how long they are offhand. Yeah, let's, uh, James, that was from James. We'll, uh, yep. we'll look at that and uh, figure it out for you. Um, remind us in the, the open networking session there. Um, oh, we did have one other question. Um, just whether or not the uh, plastic cover over the on-off switch was lockable. Um, that you can put a lock on the protective plastic cover and they're also in addition to thumb screws in order to uh, um, hold the cover closed. And there's a, a hole in the clip that holds the cover closed with or without the thumb screws tightened. Okay, guys, I think uh, we're getting close to the time where we need to wrap up here. Uh, we want to make sure that people have time to get to their next session. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Is there any last words of wisdom you guys have to share here? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just still looking at the questions coming in. Anyone whose questions we haven't answered, hop into the, the chat. I see there's a couple questions about the charge voltages and there is a, a newer recommended um, charge voltage setting. So hop into our networking session. We can go through these. All right, really good. All right, thanks all. Very good, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marlon and Nate, nice job. And uh, good luck on the rest of your sessions this afternoon to everybody attending. And uh, we will hopefully see you at the networking session, 3 p.m. Eastern time. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.